Merdeka! Lagi sekali yang bersemangat, Merdeka! Lee Kuan Yew braced himself early on in life to face history's tumultuous tides full on. From the hardships of war, with a fledgling nation in tow, he leapfrogged decades, pushing past history's disruptive currents. And we will, and faster than they can. He survived its undertow. This is your life and mine. I've spent a whole lifetime building this. And brought Singapore to where it is today, without letting time nor time deter him. The Japanese occupation was the single most important event to shape his political ideology. The deprivation, cruelty, and humiliation that the war wreaked on people revealed to Lee that to control one's destiny, one had to gain power. Lee was named Kuan Yu, which literally means light and brightness, but which also means bringing great glory to one's ancestors. We changed the complexion of Singapore. On September 16, 1923, Lee was born to English-educated parents Lee Chin Kun and Chua Jim Neo and was given the English moniker Harry by his paternal grandfather. Lee continued the family tradition of being educated in English. He read law at the University of Cambridge after excelling as a student at Raffles College. His experience of being treated as a colonial subject when he was in England in the late 1940s fueled his interest in politics and sharpened his anti-colonial sentiments. Lee later said, I saw the British people as they were. They treated you as colonials, and I resented that. I saw no reason why they should be governing me. They're not superior. I decided when I got back, I was going to put an end to this. We were born in a time of tumultuous change, where the world that we knew it was crumbling, was collapsing. Uh, when I was a little boy, the British Empire was supposed to last a thousand years. And so everybody thought, even when the Japanese went to war against China, we thought, well, that's far away. And we never believed the Japanese would attack Malay Malaya and Singapore and capture us. And we literally saw a whole society disintegrate. It collapsed overnight. And we were serfs to be trampled on to, to do their bidding. And that did something to a whole generation and said, no, why? This is my life, my country. I have something to say. Lee's political life began right after he returned to Singapore in 1950. Acting as legal advisor and negotiator, he represented the postal workers who were fighting for better pay and working conditions. He was soon appointed by many more trade unions, some of which were controlled by pro-communists. 
Together with these pro-communists, Lee and other anti-colonialists formed the People's Action Party in 1954. It was a marriage of convenience to overthrow the British. To win power, Lee needed the support of the masses. That meant reaching out to the Chinese educated, Singapore's majority. It's very interesting how he came back. You can see the political determination to master the languages so they can communicate with the people whom he will have to appeal to, to support him to, to the position of power to do good. And the determination by which he learned his Chinese, which we had none before. Lee had taken eight months of Mandarin classes in 1950. He renewed his Mandarin learning five years later at the age of 32. Within a short time, he had mastered the language sufficiently to address public audiences. In the mid-1950s, riots broke out that fueled tensions between the local government and the communist sympathizers in the Chinese community. A few pro-communist members of the PAP were arrested. Leading the PAP, Li fought for their release and ran a campaign against corruption in the 1959 elections for the Legislative Assembly. The party won by a landslide. <laughs> Lee achieved what he had set out to do. Singapore was self-governing, and he was Prime Minister. He had acquired power, but others with a different political agenda contested it. Leading Singapore meant breaking ranks with some of his anti-colonial allies, the pro-communists. Lee said of them, they were not crooks or opportunists, but formidable opponents, Men of great resolve, prepared to pay the price for the communist cause. You know, we faced the ultimate when we decided to fight the communists. And that is painful death, you know. If they ever win, they'll pull my fingernails one by one. We've got enough gumption in us. Having decided to take our lives in our own hands and fight for what we believe in is right, I say we'll fight to the end, regardless. Lee and his colleagues knew they were in for a hard fight with the pro-communists. He had seen up close how the pro-communist left-wing leaders like Lim Chin Siong could mobilize the masses through riots and strikes to paralyze a government. In the battle, it was Lee's leadership that counted most. His leadership did make a difference. I cannot imagine, for example, some of his team people surviving the, the politics of 1961 to 65. I cannot imagine them surviving without him. We have so much at stake. We have gone so far to secure the country. I say rally around and keep these evil forces. You see, they are so ashamed of themselves, they have switched the light off. Look at that. They are cowards, that's what they are. Cowards, they switch the lights off. Look at that. Are these men who are going to lead you to peace and prosperity or to ruination and perdition? Look at them. The battle lines were drawn sharply over the proposal for merger with Malaysia. The non-communists were for it, and the pro-communists were against it. There were compelling economic reasons for merger, 
But Lee was also clear about its political necessity. To him, merger was absolutely necessary to prevent Singapore and Malaya being slowly engulfed and eroded away by the communists. Lee believed building a common identity between individuals on either side of the causeway would propel them across racial and religious shores and into a common land. Make the people feel that they are wanted. Not stepchildren or stepbrothers, but one in the family and a very important member of the family. Mr. Lee was welcomed most warmly in traditional Malay style when he went round eight islands. Lee campaigned relentlessly and tirelessly for merger, speaking over the radio and in nearly every corner of Singapore. After an intense public contest with his political opponents, Lee won. Most Singaporeans voted for the union with Malaysia. City Hall is again the heart of the city-state. Crowds gather around the Padang to await the arrival of the Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, whose day this is. On September 16, 1963, which happened to be his 40th birthday, Lee declared Singapore's entry into the Federation of Malaysia. In the history of a nation, there are moments when great decisions have to be made. The day that such a moment in our lives, we, the people of Singapore, have made our country. But it wasn't always easy for the two sides to work together. Serious differences emerged. Lee wanted a Malaysian Malaysia, where Malays and non-Malays were equal. He would not condone a policy that supported Malay supremacy. Differences mounted, from conflicts between personalities and disagreements about a common market, to the PAP's participation in Malaysia's general election. Malaysian politicians considered it a breach of understanding for the PAP to take part in mainland politics. Things came to a head over constitutional rights. Lee addressed the Malaysian parliament in May 1965 in both English and Malay, laying out his case against communal politics. Tetapi, jikalau saya di rumah hendak cakap bahasa muda saya, takkan saya tak taat setia kepada Malaysia. Supaya menteri dari Sarawak takkan dia kalau balik rumah panjangnya dia cakap bahasanya Dia tak ada tak setia kepada Malaysia. Saya tidak percaya. Dia masih selalu tak setia. I think it's generally known that he caused a sensation by addressing the Parliament in Kuala Lumpur uh, in in Raja Malay. Um, he spoke Malay better than the, the many Malays. <laughs> they were absolutely astounded, and uh, I was very apprehensive about it. Um, and, and, and I was right to be apprehensive too, yes. The back benches were spellbound. They understood every word. That was the turning point. They perceived him as a dangerous man who could one day be the Prime Minister of Malaya. Well, this was the speech that changed history. When you speak in Parliament, you must speak very carefully. You, know? you, you couldn't make mistake. And he didn't finish the speech. So he asked the speaker to give him to continue the next day because Panman went on recess. So the speaker said, I give you 45 minutes the next morning. But when uh, Parliament uh, began the next morning, the speaker didn't allow, didn't allow him to speak. And he stood up, he said, you promised me yesterday, but no. So then we knew that that Malay speech must have, must have 
uh, I mean, uh, some uh, very bad effect on the leadership of the government. I noticed that while I was speaking, the uh, aligned leaders, Tunggu Berraman, Tuan Berrazak, Tan Siu Sin and the rest, were sitting in front of us. They got a table that sang low and low and low until only their head, because they were embarrassed. This man could speak Malay better than them. They say they are worried about the Malays. I say, so are we. We want to raise their standard of living. And we will, and faster than they can. And at the end of 5, 10, 15, 20 years, a new generation will grow up that will no longer respond to the special VHF they use. <laughs> They'll be tuning into the multilingual network. They'll be thinking like us, working like us, trained like us, prepared to live with us like Malaysians. Then we win. And history is on our side. But it was not to be. Racial riots sparked off a year earlier by what Lee called Malay ultras had already created a deep divide. On August 9th, 1965, Singapore separated from Malaysia. Every time we look back on this moment when we signed this agreement which severed Singapore from Malaysia, it will be a moment of anguish. I mean, for me, it is a moment of anguish because all my life, you see, the whole of my adult life. On August 9, 1965, Singapore became an independent state, but not by choice. The island's two million people faced an uncertain fate in future. Uncertainty that weighed heavily on one man. Would you mind if we stop for a while? My memory is that on the 9th of August, sometime during the course of the morning, he asked me to come over. And I had heard the previous evening that the structure was going to collapse. And then he was under great strain. And he said that Singapore had been hived off, ejected, I forget the exact word he used, from Malaysia and was now an independent country. Left with no hinterland and hardly a domestic market to speak of, Singapore's only option was for its leaders to fight hard for its survival. I have... a few million people's lives to account for. And Singapore will survive. As daunting as the task must have seemed, Lee set his sights on building a country of the future and never veered from that vision. And we will set the example. This country belongs to all of us. We made this country from nothing, from mud flats. Here, we make the model multiracial society. This is not a country that belongs to any single community. It belongs to all of us. This was a mud flat swamp. 
the day this is our modern city. Ten years from now, this will be a metropolis. Never fear. But it wasn't easy. Lee and his team soon had another crisis to deal with. In 1968, out of the blue, Britain announced its intention to withdraw its troops from Singapore. Lee now had to confront the prospect of a country without its own security forces. And thousands of workers retrenched from the British bases, joining the already large numbers of unemployed. The late journalist and author Dennis Bloodworth, a resident of Singapore since 1956, recalled Lee's reaction to the British pullout. He was extremely angry about it and said, uh, well, I'll tell you this, um, we're going to take over all their lands. Their lands uh, do not belong to them anymore. And I cannot guarantee the safety of British citizens anymore in Singapore. And Go Kuing Sui said to him, no, 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 Kuan Yu, he said, uh, 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 you're, you're, you're starting to sound like a gangster. And Lee Kuan Yu just smiled gently. <laughs> Lee's good ties with British leaders led them to extend their departure to the end of 1971. With these military bases contributing 20% to the economy, and providing jobs for 70,000 people, this softened the blow to Singapore's economy. If anybody had suggested at that moment that Singapore would become as prosperous and as remarkable as it has, I don't think it, you, 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 nobody would have believed you. And, and it is to a very large extent due to Lee Kuan Yew that this has happened. Led by Lee, the team soldiered on to hold Singapore together and make it work. The British naval bases were used to boost the economy and efforts were made to attract investors to set up industries on former British Army land. To survive what was then a hostile neighborhood, Lee used a two-pronged approach to grow the economy. First, to leapfrog the region and link up with the developed world for both capital and market initiatives. And second, to transform Singapore into a first world oasis in a third world region. With first world standards of service and infrastructure, Lee saw Singapore as the hub for businesses wanting a foothold in the region. Did he ever imagine Singapore would one day enjoy the world's highest per capita income and become a leading business center in Asia? Perhaps. Success he attributed to the confidence of foreign investors drawn to the nation's amicable industrial relations. He's emphasized that his duty was to find ways and means of getting more jobs for people and it was also the duty of the labor movement to help their fellow workers find jobs. So for that, we needed industrial peace and a certain balance, not exploitation. The National Trades Union Congress, NTUC, was formed in 1961 when the PAP split. Led by David Nair, a founding member of the PAP, the NTUC led Singapore's labor movement away from militant trade unionism to one marked by cooperation. In fact, Singapore was the first in the world to have a tripartite arrangement, where workers, employers and the government came together to discuss general wage levels. Cooperation that contributed significantly to harmonious labor relations and ultimately Singapore's rapid development in the 1970s and 80s. In government, I've never forgotten that it is in the interest of workers and their unions that you must strive for growth and development. In other words, growth is meaningless unless it is shared by the workers 
and sought, shared not only directly in wage increases, but indirectly in better homes, better schools, better hospitals, better playing fields, a healthier environment for their families and for their children to grow up. Singapore's metamorphosis from mudflat to metropolis was not just physical. Equally remarkable was the transformation of the psyche of an entire population. Within the span of a few decades, Singaporeans came to be seen as a people who could get things done. Lee Kuan Yew played a big part in that change. From the word go, he set the pace for excellence. He once told senior civil servants, I want to make sure every button works, and if it doesn't, when I happen to be around, then somebody is going to be in for a rough time, because I do not want sloppiness. If he gets uh, a couple of questions thrown at you, I, you, you go and work at it straight away and give it to him as quickly as you can. Uh, and uh, don't delay and don't, don't wait two days when you can finish uh, by tomorrow and preferably by today. Early days we talked that he appeared to be very fierce, very strict. Uh, whenever he come, uh, came down the concerns, he... Even if he went to the washroom, uh, the floor is dirty, he will... He, he will shouted. <laughs> but Mrs. Lee always there. He would not, she would not go and uh, interfere. But quietly behind the back, the soldier, don't take it serious. Don't take it serious. He is he, just like that. <laughs> right? Just clean it up. Sprucing up a young nation, however, was not so straightforward. Besides the challenge of ensuring sufficient security for the country's borders, Lee and his team had a more fundamental problem to tackle. They had a housing crisis on their hands. The 50-storey pinnacle on Cantonment Road is an icon in Singapore's half-a-century-old public housing landscape. It is built on the site of one of the earliest public housing projects in the country. Housing in the 50s was a far cry from what it is today. These were Singapore's living conditions when it achieved self-government in 1959 there was a housing crisis. To meet the nation's acute housing shortage, the PAP set up in 1960 the Housing Development Board, simply known today by its acronym HDB. Its aim, to build 10,000 homes a year. Its predecessor, the Singapore Improvement Trust, was highly skeptical the new board would meet its ambitious target. After all, the SIT built only 20,000 flats in its 30-year history. The expatriates who left the then SIT predecessor of the housing board doubted whether we could ever do it. And so did the government. So a committee was set up on the Professor Lim table to find out whether we have the capability and the material to complete 10,000 houses as planned. Well, when the committee, Lim Tebo's committee, published its report, the housing board has already completed 10,000 units of housing. <laughs> and among the doubts expressed in the report was this, and I quote, the team showed more enthusiasm than skill. The stakes were high and the difficulties daunting. 
The PAP, which just came into power, needed to deliver results fast and gain the trust and confidence of Singaporeans. The HDB's performance was crucial to the PAP's re-election in 1963. It was more than a question of providing affordable homes for the people. The social motive to do this was equally compelling. Public housing helped tighten the weave of Singapore's social fabric. Unless we have a rooted population, unless the people have something to defend. So if you ask people to defend all the big houses where the bosses live, and they live in hovels, I don't think that's tenable. So we decided from the very beginning, everybody must have a home, every family will have something to defend. Mm -hmm. And that home is, must be owner-owned, but they'll have to pay it by installments and over 20, 25 years, even 30 years. And that home, we developed over the years into the most valuable asset. Because of Lee's vision, more than 80% of Singaporeans now live in subsidized public flats that they can call their own. Singaporeans now had a personal stake in their country that went beyond feelings of patriotism. They had a physical space they could call home and a vested interest to defend it. National service to defend the country and ensure its borders were safe from external aggression took on a different dimension. After independence, Singapore was left with just two battalions of the Singapore Infantry Regiment. There was an urgent need to build a substantial defense force. And so national service was introduced in 1967 with the universal conscription making it compulsory for every male Singapore citizen to serve in the armed forces for about two years. We must never forget that our existence as an independent sovereign state cannot be made to depend on the sufferings of others. The most dependable guarantee of our independence is a strong SAF. A strong SAF in turn depends on the political will to make the effort and pay the price. National service helps to promote racial harmony too. In multiracial Singapore, English is the common language used by all races. Lee saw early on that English would be a unifier that would give Singapore an edge in the international arena. But he also believed that knowing one's mother tongue would build a sense of belonging to one's roots and increase self-confidence and self-respect. And so he championed bilingualism. But bilingualism, Lee said in retrospect, was his most difficult policy to implement. He later admitted he was wrong to assume that one could be equally fluent in two languages. Had I known all the difficulties, bilingualism, in 1965, as I know now today, would I have done differently? Yes, in its implementation, not in its policy. I do not regret the stress and the heavy burdens I put, because the other way would have been a destruction of our whole... the chance of building up some form of culture which is worth preserving. If uh, he did not succeed in uh, uh, this, uh, bringing through the, the, our education system, uh, based on bilingual education, we would not have uh, have the advantage uh, among other countries towards to tap on this uh, the China's uh, economic trade trade. He foresaw this uh, the advantage of having a bilingual, so he forced through.
Lee and his team handled issues involving race and religion with sensitivity, knowing how combustible such matters could be. The formative years of the PAP, the battles against communism and extremism, and the racial riots he lived through meant Lee never underestimated the explosive nature of race relations. When it was time to remove the small dilapidated mosques built on state land, he did so with caution. His plan was to replace these surahs with bigger and better mosques in every housing estate through voluntary contributions from the Malay Muslim community. So he said he will uh, instruct the uh, civil service to prepare circular for all Malay Muslim working in the government service to donate voluntarily to the mosque building fund. And the deduction will be through CPM. And that was a good idea. Relatively, they gave 50 cents. This mosque in Tuapayo was the first of many to be built across the island. Today, mosques in Singapore are not only places of worship, but also centers for community bonding, social events, and education. So the Malays are proud of this because every mosque belongs to them. I've got a share in every mosque in Singapore. <laughs> I consider monthly. Lee also took special interest in ensuring that Singapore's different communities would all have a share in its prosperity. He believed better education was one of the keys to uplifting the Malay community. I think the most important is that, to me, education. He really want us to help in that area. In fact, one of those days when he had lunch, he asked us parents to really look after, after our kids, be together with them, ensure that they study well, then you can make a good jump. If not a quantum jump, they will see the graph moving higher and higher. Cabinet Minister K. Shanmugam says it would have been easy for politicians in Singapore to appeal to the sentiments of the majority Chinese community to gain political power. But part of the success of Singapore, he feels, is that it had leaders like Lee who shunned racial politics. I think most sensible people in the Indian community, particularly uh, those uh, who went through the earliest struggles, older than me, I think accept this, that we have the space and we have far more liberty and opportunity in Singapore than we would have been if we were 6% in any other society, including India, where many of the upper caste Indians in Singapore wouldn't have had a chance. The best thing that MM ever did in this respect was that because of the policies that he and his team put in place, I never ever felt that I was a minority. I've always grown up thinking of myself as Singaporean and not anything else. After we became independent, his, the point which he always reiterated was never do to the minorities in Singapore what happened to us when we were a minority in Malaysia. Always make sure that the Malays, that most Indians have their space, can live the way, their way of life and have full and equal opportunities and are not discriminated against. At the same time, help them to upgrade, improve, move forward. Singapore is widely known in the world for being a clean city, both in its environment and governance. It is the least corrupt country in Asia, and according to the World Bank, one of the most preferred places in the world to do business. But it was not always graft-free. Corruption was widely prevalent when Singapore was still a British colony. In the 1959 election, the PAP, then the opposition, campaigned against the government's corrupt practices. I am convinced we will thrive, flourish, and 
The PAP's anti-corruption position resonated well with the voters. When the PAP government took office, Lee and his team turned up in all white as a promise to the people that their leaders will not stand for corruption and will be whiter than white. Over the years, the leadership's zero tolerance for corruption earned Singapore a reputation for having a clean and effective government. No small claim, considering how some countries continue to struggle to keep on the straight and narrow. Establishing the rule of law, public security and safety were fundamental to the success of the PAP. Security is taken as a given in today's Singapore. Lee applied the effort to stay clean to the island's physical transformation as well. From the outset, he was adamant that urban development did not proceed haphazardly. He had seen how a lack of planning had marred other cities and was determined that Singapore did not make the same mistake. Most other cities or countries would say, well, let's take care of the economic development first, even at the expense of the environment, and then we try to fix the environment. He did not take that stand at all. He wanted to pave the foundation for Singapore to have a first world environment when we become world first, become first world economy. So much so that I think after a while, when we reach a certain, across a certain hum in tackling, tackling the environmental ills and move into further improvement, the good environment became an economic asset. I was really struck by how much he was taken up with this idea of the greening of Singapore. He just believed that, uh, that having trees and shrubbery, um, uh, you know, you don't have a concrete jungle around the place. It's, it's not only aesthetically good, it has, I suppose it has something to do with the soul of the Singaporean, you know, give a certain softness and a certain calmness. Lee expressed his passion for greening Singapore in practical ways. He planted a tree every year, a tradition he started on June 16, 1963, with the planting of a mempart sapling. It kicked off an island-wide tree planting initiative and launched Tree Planting Day, a national campaign that helped Singapore earn its garden city reputation. Lee said in his memoirs, after independence, I searched for some dramatic way to distinguish Singapore from other third world countries and settled for a clean and green Singapore. Greening is the most cost effective project I've launched. Lee's original vision of a garden city evolved over the years into the concept of a city in a garden with some two million trees planted island wide. In June 2012, this transformation was celebrated when the breathtaking Gardens by the Bay opened. This is just one example of how we're transforming Singapore's living environment. It may be a densely populated city, maybe one of the densest in the world, but we are determined that our people should be able to live comfortably, pleasantly, graciously. And not just with good homes, efficient public transport, or safe streets, but also to be in touch with nature, to be never far from green spaces and blue waters. Lee was not known to be sentimental about buildings or landmarks. He was practical yet ambitious about transforming the nation's landscape, even when it came to defying nature. In 10 years, that's have fishing in the Singapore River and fishing in the Kallang River. It can be done. One of Lee's most important initiatives started in 1977. It involved the Singapore River, 
historically the lifeblood of the economy and the center of commercial activity. The river had been the conduit for Singapore's entreport trade, allowing for the movement of goods from the port to the city. Over the years, it had degenerated into a filthy, congested, polluted waterway. The industries along its banks had been dumping sewage and garbage into its waters. When I was living in Hoklam Street in Chinatown, I see very few people swimming there. It was full of stench. The water was really poisoned, you know, po poison black. Nobody could even wade through that water. I remembered when I was studying uh, in the secondary school in Kenning Seng. I used to walk through South Beach Road and looking at Singapore River, uh, I have to close my nose. Lee proposed what to everyone was a monumental feat, a clean-up. Mr. Lee had thought through the plan and envisioned a Singapore which would be clean and green with riverine recreational amenities in the heart of the, of the city. He was confident that the scheme was doable and it was a question of organizing ourselves and getting the job done. The Singapore River was reborn, a mammoth task that took 10 years to complete. Today, it is not only glistening again, its banks are bustling with trendy restaurants, clubs and offices. Singapore had an economic advisor by the name of Dr. Winsemius. He retired. And after we cleaned up the Singapore River, he came back to Singapore, I think at the invitation of the government. And uh, when he heard about the success and that fish has returned to the Singapore River, he went down to the mouth of Singapore River to do some fishing. He caught a fish, and it was a large one. He was surprised, and I was very pleased that he caught a fish. And uh, we didn't put any fish in the river. The Singapore River, now part of the Marina Reservoir, is a constant reminder of the man who defied time and tide. Its transformation, mirroring the fascinating evolution of a small backwater into a thriving global metropolis. Its currents echo the ebb and flow of one man's life as he turned an impossible dream into reality.